Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Story Studio podcast. Uh, we're doing another of our state of the industry uh, shows today. And today we have on Dave Chesson from Kindlepreneur and also of Dave Chesson fame. <laughs> uh, and uh, we, we actually hadn't met Dave for the longest time, um, despite orbiting in the same circles until very recently. And by very recently, I mean, you know, before the world changed, which feels like a- it was like a few weeks before the world just turned upside <laughs> down and like <laughs> shook us out like salt from a shaker. It was in um, the world became Florida, basically. Yes, <laughs> it was the last week of February. So we really are talking two weeks before travel became something people used to do. <laughs> So um, yeah, so yeah, so it's 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 good to see you again. Um, and I wonder if we could start by just a, give your description of what it, what exactly like how your how your business began, how you got into this, and just sort of tell your story for folks who may not know. Sure. Well, I actually used to be in the the military as a military diplomat, and uh, the first real big assignment I was given was a two year tour in Korea without my family. Um, I had three children at the time, and it was kind of one of those moments of realizing that, wow, I'm, you know, I've already spent a lot of time away from them and I'm spending more time. And that's when my wife and I decided that I wanted to create some kind of career that would allow me to be home, um, not traveling, not being deployed. And so that's when I started to get into writing. My problem though was, was that I have dyslexia. I am, I'm not Ernest Hemingway. A matter of fact, my entire high school career was spent uh, just hoping to get a passing grade in English. Um, went to UW-Madison to become a physics major, as far away from writing for that purpose. So to really get involved in uh, writing, it not only took me a lot of practice and a lot of work to improve my writing, but more importantly, for someone like me, in order to be able to build enough income to be able to leave the military and support my family and have an author career, I really needed to understand book marketing. Uh, you can write a great book, but if you can't market your book, you know, you're know you gonna have a very hard time just getting seen as well as be able to see that success. So I really hunkered down, analyzed Amazon, what they do, uh, why they do what they do. And from that, I was able to use information to be able to build my author career. And kind of fast forward today, I am now here in Nashville. Uh, I've been a full-time author for four plus years um, and just, loving it. I got to drop my kids off at school today and I'm picking them up later. And I, I kind of enjoy the fact that I'm probably the only dad in the, in the pickup line. So uh, just really blessed and uh, really thankful for everything that's happened from, from writing. And, and as far as that learning for people listening, um, Kindlepreneur is a really well put together site. I just want to props on that. It's the sort of thing oh, that I know that during our education phase, we were trying to do. If you go to kindlepreneur.com, yes, go to start here. Really, really right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean it's it's there's just a ton of information that's that's just on there um, to get you to get you started. So so awesome on that and um, and yeah, thank you, thank you. So that really means a lot. You're you're very welcome. Um, I am curious though. I did want to divert just a tiny bit from sort of what I planned to ask because I, I forgot the dyslexia thing, and I know that you mentioned that. But um, could you just talk a little bit about how that's factored in? I know it's not quite on topic, but you don't hear a lot of you know the the unique concerns of dyslexic writers yeah well it was interesting is is that when I my mother picked up she was a nurse and she picked up on the signs that I had um kind of some disabilities uh in some certain areas I had speech impediments I <laughs> we have a lot of long-standing family jokes about me I couldn't say my my TRs and they came out with PRs so imagine when you're asking for your favorite cereal which is called tricks uh, <laughs> uh, you know, so they, they have a lot of fun. Those are delicious. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> they're for Apparently kids. They're for kids. <laughs> they're right. for kids. Oh my God. <laughs> um, so I had that. I also, I, I, there was a lot of hand-eye coordination. Um, as a matter of fact, I, you really see a lot of it when you watch me write. Um, a lot of people cringe when they see how I write from all over the place, uh, where I start. Um, there's actually a lot of forms of dyslexia. And so I just... And to this day, uh, my, <laughs> my, this is a really embarrassing story, but uh, um, I, there's an episode in The Simpsons that mimicked this. Um, I once had to write a note for my high school daughter uh, because she was going to be late for something. And the principal looked at the note and thought it was so baloney that there's no way an adult wrote that, that they actually called me to verify that I did the note. Only to realize that, yeah, no, that's that's my handwriting. Yep, that's my signature. And the person was like, 
oh, okay, I'm sorry to bother you, sir. And I was just like, I am you know, offended. <laughs> yeah. The uh, best part is the Simpsons had an episode where that exact thing happened, except he was watching Homer Simpson write out. He's like, oh, never mind. We'll move past <laughs> that, you know? So I was like, that was my Homer Simpson moment. So did you uh, also, like, um, uh, per the Simpsons, write in the note, forgive the uh, messiness I busted, whichever hand it is I write with. <laughs> <laughs> No, I got nothing to say except for that's just the way it is. So you'll see me kind of write backwards. Uh, I start in different places and it's pretty cringeworthy. All right. So pivoting away from that and toward the industry as a whole. So the big picture for all these state of the industry things is sort of obviously what is the state of the industry, but let's, you know, go back just a little bit. And how would you say the industry has changed um, in the past few years or, or since you've been into it, basically? And how do you figure out Amazon? That's the, the big question. You said you figured out Amazon. How, how does anyone do that? I don't think Jeff has figured out Amazon yet. Yeah, well, when I approach Amazon, one of the things I like to ask myself is what, what makes Amazon more money? I mean, put yourself in the shoes of Amazon. They once spent millions of dollars to get the exact hex, hexadecimal number for the orange button. And that just by, just by AB testing like crazy on the color of their buy button, uh, they were to inc they increased their I think it was like 2.6 percent. They increased their conversion rate by 2.6 percent. Imagine that for a multi-billion dollar company. So a lot of what they do on Amazon isn't just random. It's not guessing. They're tweaking their their A/B testing, their A/B testing between different markets, locations, IP addresses, shoppers. They want to know what's going to sell more. Um, and when you really kind of put yourself in those shoes, it, it starts to help you to sort of understand maybe from a different light why they do what they do. Another thing that's been really beneficial that I do a lot on Kindlepreneur is that I'm very blessed to have um, such great people on the email list. And one thing I really love to do is I send out surveys to experiment. Uh, we once did an, a, a crazy uh, hardcore experiment where, and I love that people truly trusted me to send this information in, but I said, can you please send me the seven Kindle keywords that you filled in? right now. And I used my programming team and we developed a, team, uh, a, a crawl bot to basically figure out what words those people were indexed for and where their rankings were for everything. Now this was like ridiculously expensive. Nothing I can really recreate where it's free for people to use because that would be awesome. But uh, it costs a lot just to run the crawlers. So we got the information. And then what I did was I went through each and every one of them. We had over a thousand people send this in and we changed, we, we noticed that, okay, if they put in one or two words in there, then we asked them to fill in the entire box for all seven. And if they had filled in the entire box, we asked them to put in a single phrase in each one of the boxes. And we had about, out of the thousand, we had like 600 people do exactly that. So then after they did that, we had the crawler go through and we had to crawl and continue to crawl and pull information. And we started to mark exactly what was going on and how Amazon was influenced by either having more words in the box or less words in the box. So this gave us like clear empirical information to finally answer that question of should you fill in as many characters inside that seven Kindle keywords or should you just stick to, to one or two? It also gave us an understanding on how Amazon actually does a lot more than that. Um, and so again- and What was I'm, the answer? The answer is, is to be very, very quick on it, is that all the words and phrases you put inside one box, Amazon uses combinations of those phrases. So maybe it's two out of the five, they'll, they'll use three out of the five and different, different um, pairings where the words in front or in the back. They also automatically do plural, pluralizations um, and they'll index you for all those groupings. The problem though is, is that your initial rankings uh, from that indexing is actually a lot less. Um, so my ultimate book marketing recommendation from the data we collected is, is that if you have a phrase that you truly love, that you think is perfect, that meets all the wickets, then just put it in there. Don't cram other words with it. However, though, for the rest of the boxes, fill in as many genre level groupings, you know, phrases that didn't quite make the cut, put them in there and you're going to be indexed more. I think that's kind of the best of both worlds and gets the biggest uh, bang for the, for the buck. So to kind of go back to this, uh, the key is, is that I like to do a lot of experiments because there's a lot of theoretical stuff out there. There's a lot of people that say, hey, I saw this, but we also see that there's um, 
sometimes stipulations like, well, yeah, you're in fiction. That might not work in nonfiction. So I really what like to conduct actually, experiments. What's your ratio of like fresh experimentation to, okay, I, we already have this established. We know how this works. We're just going to scale solutions and answers and all of that for what we already know. Well, back when I started Kindlepreneur, it was a lot of just from experience. Uh, then as Kindlepreneur grew, it became using kind of the email list to kind of help build that out. And then because I'm the owner of Publisher Rocket as well, um, I have databases and servers and crawlers and um, we're collecting data like crazy on Amazon Books. Um, uh, one, one of the features that's going to come out in a couple months that I haven't made public is that we will now be able to give all rocket owners the ability to see historical category data for all 14,000 Amazon categories. Uh, you click it, it'll pop up and you can see how that category has trended, how the you know number of competitors that have entered into the category to the number of sales that have happened inside a category. So people can make decisions um, on that sort of stuff. And when you start collecting data like that, you can really start to see hey, look at this. Here's the percentage of self-published books that are, you know, crushing it compared to published books. Um, you know, here's trends in, in uh, market love, you know, that, that, hey, Amazon's starting to lean towards this. Uh, or also, too, my favorite is <laughs> they make a lot of changes, right? Uh, so my team has to be able to, you know, quickly pivot and, and say, wow, they just changed their category system. Great, guys. Let's figure out what they did right now and get it fixed. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a lot of that. <laughs> and that's how often not my is that one. like? How often does that break your your model of everything you're doing? That they, they just boom. <laughs> well, let's see. Um, I would say, and this kind of gets us back to our original uh, purpose here. One of the things I've seen Amazon really experiment with is categories. Um, you know, over the years, they used to be able to give you they used to give you all the categories you were a part of, not just the three, but if you were in more than three, they would show it. Furthermore, they would also show the entire category string. And for the listeners out there, that's where, you know, it's like the main category, which is like Kindle store and then Kindle and then, you know, science fiction and fantasy and then and all the way down to the final, you know, string. And we call that the string. They would show the entire string. Well, now they don't show strings. They just show the kind of general term. And this is a bit um, confusing for, for a lot of people because, say, for example, sci-fi military. Sci-fi military is actually in five different main categories, not just in science fiction and fantasy. They also have like lit uh, literary fiction. You have a young adult. You even have a nonfiction one, which that one doesn't make sense, but it's there. Um, and there's, a, there's a couple more I can't remember off the top of my head. But the point is, is that now when you see sci-fi military, it doesn't matter if it's YA or if it's um, nonfiction or whatever. It just says science fiction military. And quilting. Yeah, right. Uh, and so what we, uh, so I'm not a fan of what they did there. But again, they, they decided to change that for some reason. Uh, there also used to be the ability that you could investigate and figure out what categories you were a part of, or another book was a part of by taking the ASAN number of that book, putting it in the search bar, clicking search, and then on the left, you could start to do this almost like choose your own adventure and you could pick book and then next and next and next and all of a sudden it would finally show you all the sub sub categories that the book was a part of. Then all of a sudden they started doing away with that on international markets, keeping it on the US side. And then finally they're like, okay, yeah, that works. And they just killed it. So now it's almost near impossible to figure out uh, without programs like uh, Nerdy Book Girl has a free tool out there. I think it's called like Category Hunter um, where you can put in the ASN number of a book and it will pull you know, all the categories for someone. Um, but again, it's like, why did you guys get rid of it? But they why, did. why do you think they did? Did they do it to prevent people from, you know, writing crappy books to try to flood this or, or rank in certain sub 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 categories? This would be pure speculation on my part, but it's based on things. But I it's database speculation, <laughs> but, right? No, not on this case. So the question is why did they did it? So why did they do it? Um, my belief, and that's looking, <laughs> here's, here's the thing. We came out with a feature called Unleash the Categories, right? On, inside of Rocket, where it will immediately tell you all the categories, all the books are a part of that you're looking at um, and all the data for it, right? The problem though, is we had a lot of people that came back at us. So it was like, your, your, your program's wrong. There, you know, it says that this, per, you know, like you said, like quilting, you know, this romance book is a part of quilting. That's, that's wrong. And I'm like, ooh, well, we looked at that book and it actually is quilting. And what we kept finding was there were so many books that are in categories that they should not be in. And 
some of me thinks that people are now doing it more often because nobody can find out, you know, and when you get marked as bestseller on the search results, it only says bestseller. It doesn't scam. say bestseller. Scam. Quilting. <laughs> so, and, and also we're, we're about to implement the UK market in rocket in like two weeks. Uh, so that's, that's something I haven't announced either, but that's coming out in two weeks. And that category system is insanely bad. I mean, it's like, it's so bad that I feel like there's going to be an uproar when we announce it because everybody's going to be like, there's fiction books and nonfiction, like big nonfiction ones. There's romance in horror, like guys without shirt romance in horror. Like it's really bad. Like it's such a messed up system right now that some of me wonders if whether or not, instead of trying to subjectively figure it out, because let's face it, right? There's seven plus million books on there. The only way that you could clean up the categories is if you have humans, which cost money, right? Back to what makes Amazon more money. If you have humans go through and check all these and start removing them. Okay. Or you just make it clear that, you know, it's, it doesn't show the full category string so that shoppers don't be like, what the heck is this horror book doing in quilting? You know, I feel like it was just them kind of sweeping Like your customer rug, voice. Maybe. Can you use that for the rest of the interview? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, if it was maybe seven o'clock and it was bourbon hour, uh, maybe. <laughs> See, it seems to me that Amazon would, would really, really, like I feel like there has to be a solution in the offing because that's not annoying to writers. I mean, it is a little bit. It's annoying to, to customers. And Amazon serves the customer, not us. And so it does seem like, I mean, the customer experience in my, in my experience, browsing for books is terrible. Like you, it's unusable. So it seems like they have to fix it somehow or they're going to lose customers. It could, or we did a, um, an experiment uh, using a heat map. So what we did was we paid this company to bring in a whole bunch of people. Um, it got postponed a bit thanks to Corona, but I've got Good. enough data for some of them. And what it was, was a computer that used kind of this camera system up at the top and it would watch your eyes and where you looked on the screen and mark what it was you were doing. Now, we had over 100 people at least on the first go. Uh, we wanted to do more and we wanted to do more in specific genres. It's just really costly. But we had them look at like, for example, they said they were fantasy fans. So then I had them look at a couple of fantasy books um, and the book sales page. And we marked using kind of where their eyes went and what they clicked and what they engaged with. And what I found was, is that the cat, like, I, there's a lot of information we collected from it, but the categories weren't even looked at. Um, matter of fact, uh, it was never a part of the shoppers. No, no one stopped at it. No one said, oh, whoa, let me make sure this is the right category. It's because something that matter, authors are much more concerned about, but readers bingo. don't care at all. It's exactly. like the traditional versus published or traditional versus indie question. And we are really hung up on that. But right. a reader just wants a professional looking product. D That's Dave, exactly this may, it. This may be where you're going, but I'm wondering, because that is, that is an approach, the heat map approach is it, it, you're starting with a page. You're starting with them where they need to go. And then the question, seem, if I'm understanding it right, seems yep. to be, are they considering the categories? So mm -hmm. my comment is a little bit more of finding the book to begin with, but do you have any data on whether or not people are finding them by browsing or do they pretty much usually go in knowing what they want to find or following all bots or something? So... What we are, what we're seeing um, is that we're definitely seeing that there are a lot of people that start their buyer's journey by typing in things and typing in things and typing in things and altering it. Um, what I've seen is like, say, for example, you're a first time buyer. You decide that you want to buy a fantasy book. You're a fantasy fan, I guess, right? You were told. Um, so you go, you type in fantasy books. And what we find is that there are a lot of people that search fantasy books. But what we can all agree on is, is that what are the chances Amazon's going to show you the perfect kind of fantasy book that you're thinking of? So then what we see is, is that people will then, instead of deleting fantasy book, they add words to the end of fantasy book. They, so it's like fantasy book uh, necromancer. And then they look at the results and they're like, well, okay, that's too dark. Sorry, let's, let's, let's maybe delete necromancer. Let's go back and let's do a uh, war mage. Yeah, like, or, or like Lord of the Rings, or you see they start augmenting and sometimes they'll delete when it went down the wrong avenue and sometimes they'll just add to it. One of my favorite examples of this is, is that I was doing research with a romance writer and uh, we found that her number one keyword was second chance romance, right? I mean, that's really what her book was about. 
But a killer one was is that we found that second chance romance with baby was actually by far the best keyword phrase for her. And the reason for this, and again, kind of going back to that mentality of typing, is that people would type in second chance romance and they'd see a whole slew of guys without their shirts on. And they're like, whoa, 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 I'm looking more like a family wholesome book. And then some people come up with the word wholesome, uh, which is always a qualifier <laughs> for certain types of romance. Um, and, but instead, the first thing that came in is, I want this to be about family. A woman with child uh, who is looking for love again finds a lover who loves her, even though she has child. This is already innocent. It's not going to be hot and steamy. You don't have you know infants or children involved in hot and steamy. So it's funny is, is that when you start to look at the etymology or the, the root of, of some of these search paths, you can see how they come over time. And you can see that people are truly altering phrases to start to better describe the type of book that they want. And you get some wonky stuff like second chance romance with baby. I mean, that just grammatically that is horrible. <laughs> exactly. Baby it's romance. Horrible. That's not no, wholesome. But, but I, this is fascinating. This, this, so this is just SEO right? Um, yeah, yeah. It's back in the day when I had to write a lot of SEO, it, it, I was always astounded by the language I thought people would use versus the language they actually used. And there's, it, it I think at one point I read something that like 54% of Google searches are brand new searches for the first time, right? Yeah. So most people are searching things that are new and they're just like not even thinking about the, the combinations. But I like what you're saying because they're, there, people are specifically looking for books, but it's not just based on the way their brain th works. It's based on what they're seeing visually and what's Feedback. being suggested to them. Yeah, it's, 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 it's SEO kind of 2.0. Exactly. And I would say that in Amazon, especially kind of comparing between Google SEO and Amazon SEO is, is that I think Google's a lot better at being able to quickly present uh, what, the, what the person's looking for. Because most of the time we can quickly describe, we have a question. How do I do this? What do I do? How does one do this, et cetera? Like we usually pose questions and questions can be answered directly. When you're trying to describe a book, especially if you're not like a super avid reader, you may start from the beginning and say, science fiction book, you know, best science fiction book, free science fiction, I don't know. And you just start. But I would say in Amazon, also people are quicker to just add to the end add to the end. So you, you do a, a red blouse. Great. Okay. Red blouse with high cuffs. You know, you, you keep with the red because you want the cuffs, you want the red blouse, but then you add something to it. So what we end up seeing is, is that a lot of, and this goes with books, is that a lot of the real money-making keywords are actually long-tailed. Uh, they're a combination of words and phrases. This also goes back to the discussion we talked about with the seven Kindle keywords. This is that Amazon knows that there are certain long-tailed phrases um, and by the way, anybody who doesn't know that phrase long tail means is when you have lots of words inside the, the phrase that you put in. So we call it long tail, uh, short tail or broad, long tail and niche. Um, Amazon knows that the long tails really do convert. Um, I, I've told people that I would much rather, if I wrote a sci-fi military book, okay, I would much rather rank um, for number one, for a very long tail phrase that say 500 people a month type in, then rank in the top 10 for a phrase that 2 million type in. Yeah. Because if that long tail phrase truly describes my book and I'm at the top, I really will convert. I will convert well. And what you we've also that. seen, <laughs> yeah. It, um, say for example, it's sci-fi military bug hunt, right? I mean, that <laughs> right there describes my kind of book. Uh, I love me some bug killing type, you know, alien starship troopers. When's the last troopers. time you watched Starship Troopers? <laughs> oh man, let me tell you. Um, do, do, it's do, on Netflix do, now. Do all do people's uh, searches in the the odd behavior uh, and word choices that they kind of string together? Does that affect categories? Does Amazon put the books in a different category? Could that be part of the explanation as to why they're in wonky categories? So it, so here's, here's what we think is happening. And again, this is um, conjecture. okay? Um, I'm always gonna be very clear when I've got empirical data to support or what we feel from what we've seen. Um, when people go to publish their book for the first time, they choose those categories that Amazon shows, shows for the first time, right? And 
as we know, those aren't really Amazon categories. Those are BISACs, which are international standard codes. Um, it's sort of like the international supply chain logistics that has been accepted by all book companies as the codes you choose. Um, there's like 4,700 BISACs, whereas Amazon has 14,000 categories. Um, and to give that a bit more explanation is, is that I'm a mom and pa shop and I have 20, say, um, uh, bookshelves. And 20 of those bookshelves, each one is a genre. Well, I can put into my supply chain code that these 300 BISACs equate to this bookshelf. These 400 equate to this bookshelf. And so now it's my way of being able to say, okay, all these books that have been published, I can now put them in the right spot. Uh, Amazon kind of does the same way where when you go to publish your book, they choose from those. You, well, you choose from them. You tell Amazon, hey, here's the BISAC codes that I identify my book to be a part of. Amazon will take that and then they will choose or guess at the right Amazon category that fits that BISAC code you put in there. This is also why in the past we've also seen where there are certain categories that require a keyword in order to be put in there. Um, and so a lot of people still think you have to do that. But here's the thing. If you contact Amazon to change or add your keywords, they will do it automatically. They'll just, got it, done, here it is. Um, even if it's one that requires a keyword, you don't need a keyword anymore because you're telling them to do it. The whole keyword thing exists because they need help in figuring out which ones to put you in. So they're guessing. Uh, they look at your keywords at this point because you haven't told them which categories to really be put in. And they're trying to figure out some of the categories to put you in. We think, this is again my conjecture, we believe that sometimes Amazon either gets it wrong because they look at your book description and they looked at your metadata and they made the wrong decision. Um, I have, there are people who I truly believe are legitimate good authors that wouldn't make that scammy category decision that have found that their book was put in something that they truly did not put it in. Um, and it was eye opening and it, 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 it you know, so, almost brought so, okay, tears. So, so is this correct there. that there's, there's so much content going up to Amazon that there's zero human curation there. So the point of mm -hmm. sending them an email to ask for a category change is to move it from machine learning to human um, interaction. Yeah, give you full control, real control. Yep. Because there's nobody who's gonna look at that and say, wow, that's a ridiculous category mismatch. You as the author have to do that and then take the step to, um, to correct the problem with it. That's Amazon. correct. Now, the only category systems that actually have stringent control is children's, children's and YA. Uh, there's a lot of rules and stipulations that you have to do for that. But that's also because Amazon's trying to see YA on that. Um, you know, a lot of companies have been uh, just about destroyed um, over uh, some of the new laws. I'm, I'm blanking out on all the laws that came out and some of the legal cases that happened. But there was a whole bunch that where children were... Um, it, being sold to or at seeing advertisements and seeing things that were just absolutely wrong. Uh, this is a big reason why erotica became, you know, the, uh, a, a true black sheep of the, of the Amazon market that you can't do advertisement because it's them trying to protect from the, I think it was the FCC. Boy, I'm going to kick myself for missing all these terms. But uh, the key is, is that you really have to fight to be legitimately placed in those categories. And they're, they're going to have real human control on that on the rest, send it in. Uh, you know, it's kind of the, the, the dark truth of how they handle it. They do have humans. Um, one of my favorite things about requesting for a category is that if you're in the United States, you can put in your telephone number and they'll call you. You'll have a human call you um, and you can just tell them which ones you want and they just go with it. Uh, I haven't heard of them rejecting anybody but even like, wait a second, you silly author. That one's for, you know, uh, romance. You're a uh, Space Marine one. Come on now. Well, he didn't uh, kiss a girl. No, they're not going to play that game. They'll just be like, okay. They're like sure. reading your book to make sure. <laughs> yeah, right. They totally well, have the bandwidth to do that. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so I have, I have, so three things. The first is that I just watched Starship Troopers recently. Just ah. okay. <laughs> hey, um, the second is that um, I'm, I'm really glad that people like you and like Alex Newton are out here doing this data work because man, that is not my wheelhouse at all. And the idea of, of saying, okay, so, so do putting keywords in your description make a difference? Like, blah, like I can't handle it. So, um, but digging in on that sort of thing is the sort of thing you can read on, on your blog, on the Kindlepreneur blog and, and, and so forth. 
Um, those are just comments. The, the, the real question is, um, we've been digging real deep into like specific data sorts of things that maybe Amazon has changed and maybe they haven't. Um, what, what do you think about a, a larger, more sort of qualitative um, impression of how the industry has changed, where it's going in the time that uh, you've been doing this? Well, one of the biggest change I've seen is, is publishers acceptance of self-published works. Um, I, I've, I've been blessed to be sitting in some of the conference rooms when they decide which authors they select and which ones they don't. Um, I've also been blessed to be able to talk with them about some of their, shall we call it recruiting. Um, what used to be the case where they looked at self-publishers and they used to think like, these are, these are, you know, want to be published authors, you know, and, and they kind of look down on it. Um, they look down on Amazon. And what I've really started to see is, is that they started to see that this is almost like free agency, you know, here's proven talent. Here, here are people who have proven that people like their books. We don't have to guess. We don't have to spend time in reading their books. We just know that, okay, obviously this person can write a book in this genre that we really care about. So they're seeing it go from amateur to market tested. And Bingo. imagine what they could do if they had our resources. Right. And even more so is, is that this author has proven they can make sales on their own. Now think if that person does that with combining with our capability, how this is a already proven situation. And they're becoming more aware of that by the day to the point that you start seeing amazing companies pop up that are, instead of saying, you come to us and we'll figure out who we keep, they're going to the authors and saying, we want you and here's our deals. And, and I'm, I'm just starting to see a lot of shift and that publishing companies are seeing Amazon as a minor's league, uh, a free agency, um, what it really is, which is, you know, authors that have proven themselves uh, instead of some editor just trying to guess. So yeah, I love that framing. I, I think that's exactly right. And that's where a lot of smart people right now are going to get really rich scooping yeah. up talent because here's the thing the way things are evolving, it, we went from one extreme to another where we had, you know, publishing, everything was gatekeeper. You had to send in the query letter. You had to get permission. You had to be anointed. You had to make it through the slush pile. You had to actually sell so that you could get a second and a third book out there. What a nightmare, right? But then indie publishing came out and glory, glory, hallelujah. Now we can all publish. We don't have to ask for permission, but we have to write a quality story. We have to get a quality edit. We have to get a quality cover. We have to write a quality product description. We have to get the, in front of an audience. We have to build a list. We have to talk to that list and we have to do it over and over and over. That, so we went from one extreme all the way to the other. And now there's a lot of people with this whole rapid release thing where it's like, I can't keep up. So right. you're going to get a whole bunch of authors who are like, I, I just want to tell good stories. <laughs> and, and the flip side of this is, which is creating a lot of garbage in the marketplace in some cases. Yeah. So I think it's that market correction where you see, you know, the quality will get better. And then the, those authors who have been very capable indie publishers, but don't really want to do all the mess. They just want to write that. That's where we're going to see some real consolidation. I think. Absolutely. Um, another thing that I'm also seeing too with the publishing companies is, is that they're starting to really take Amazon seriously. Um, I have that free Amazon ads course and it almost became like a giant uh, calling card for publishing companies because they started using it because they wanted to start learning Amazon ads. And then all of a sudden I'm getting contacted to go consult them to figure out how they can build a division that specializes in Amazon advertisement. Um, I, I say that this is a real departure because I used to hear mention of selling on Amazon is like a necessary evil and we'll do what we need to do. But traditionally we've done it this way in the past. This is how we're going to do it. And now it's I'm already seeing, lasted a couple hundred years. It'll last another. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. And, and now I'm starting to see them create divisions uh, specific to Amazon and optimization um, as well as Amazon ads. And I, I see them really starting to take that seriously. And that's because when you look at some of the top selling authors on Amazon, there's a lot of self publishers and uh, publishing companies are realized that they have to either get with the times or they're going to, you know, they're going to get, they're going to drown. They're, they're going to become useless to an extent uh, or they're not going to have as much market value. So I would say that those are two of the biggest things that I've seen, at least on how Amazon has affected the traditional publishing uh, world. I, I have a question about like this. I mean, there's so much data out there 
and there's just so much to pay attention to. And even if you do start to scratch at it, okay, I'm curious, I'm, I wanna understand how this all works. What do you pay attention to? And is there, is there a common denominator there or does it completely depend on who you are as an author and what you're planning to do, where your genres are? So for example, you were talking about um, how all the historical data is going to be um, available soon, right? That's super exciting unless you're really overwhelmed by data, right? So right, yeah. is that something that like everybody should understand historical you know, data because you're trying to figure out, I mean, what a great way to future cast is by looking at what's happened so far, right? So is, is that something where you, you look at that or if you're starting out, it's really not good to get overwhelmed. Like how do you manage, because you are a data guy, right? So you, you automatically see everything as the matrix. But if somebody else is coming into it and they're just an author trying to get some basic visibility, well, how do you know what to pay attention to? So I'm actually uh, writing a Kindlepreneur article on exactly that. Like, how do you use historical data to actually help you? Now, the key is, is that for fiction, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a very, there, there may be some people that disagree with what I'm about to say, but I really think that um, categories are more important for fiction authors than nonfiction. Um, I believe in that for the reason of, as a shopper, I need to know that it's a lit RPG fantasy book, not that it's just a fantasy book. So the identification of a subgenre is extremely important. And I think as a, as a shopper, that's going to be important. Now, I would venture to say that your book cover and your description should reaffirm to me that this is a lit RPG cult, uh, cultivation game lit type style. And if you basically have those three words, you probably sold me. Um, but that being said, when I'm, a, when I'm a fiction writer, I am trying to figure out what sub sub genre that I want to write in. Okay. Or, you know, like maybe I am into vampire romance, but the question is, is that should I also include werewolves, you know, or, or, or where, where is or this babies. Whole, or, or with babies? Yeah, that's right. Vampire babies. It's, we got something now, David, we've got something. I like this, but the key is, is that um, sometimes it's really important for authors in certain subgenres to either understand the trend. So to look at it and say, wow, this is really trending down or is it trending up? Or maybe if I add this component that I can be a part of this wave that's occurring, that's one key thing to look at when you're looking at the historical data. The second thing too is, is that as you can look over the historical data over a year, hopefully in another year we'll have two years and more years and so forth. You can see if there's a certain oscillation that happens based off of the seasons, you know, certain categories may be really hot in February and really cold in January or, you know, or July, you know, or something. And if you see this cyclical motion, it may help you to choose when you should launch your book. So those are two of the key specific questions we hope to answer with just showing the historical category data. Now, as a programming team, it's our job to make sure that the UX, or as we call it, the user experience, um, doesn't make it so that information gets in your face until you've really selected that subcategory and you want to learn more. So that's going to come out on us to try to figure that out. I call it my <laughs> muzzy factor. Um, All right. So what, what about, uh, I mean, probably the biggest question, debate, constant churn in indie publishing is KU versus wide, right? That's mm. just the conversation that everybody always has. So what does the data tell us about Kindle Unlimited versus wide? Um, go, going back a few years, but what are the trends that you're seeing and how do you think that that argument looks right now and what do you think it's gonna evolve into in the next couple, three, four or five years? My general rule of thumb is if you're in fiction, you should really think about KU and if you're in nonfiction, you should really try not to do KU. Um, and the reason why I say that is because what we found from our data is that most of the real KU subscribers are like rabid fiction readers of a certain genre. Right. Okay? So it's not just fiction, it's genre fiction. So if you write it's literary genre, fiction, right. you shouldn't yeah, no. necessarily. Okay, right. Yeah, you're going to have certain stipulations. There will be like, it's my general rule to just say, you should think about it if you're fiction, you should think about not doing it if you're nonfiction. It's kind of like my general way of putting it. But like, if you're a romance and you're not doing KU, you might have shot yourself in the foot a couple of times. Um, I mean, there we found that that is the most used KU uh, genre 
uh, by far. And a lot of that's because people are really wanting to get their, their quick steamy romance or their romance. And, um, you know, Kindle is actually, uh, this is kind of one of the reasons why erotica took off when Kindle came out was for the first time, um, someone could read a steamy erotica romance and not have to show the cover in public. They could be sitting there on their Kindle and they could do it. Erotica has been around in church, in a subway, in front of, you know, at, at yeah, the kindergarten it was the, class. It was the it very first digital black bag or brown paper bag. That's right. And Erotica has been around for a long time. I remember going into the, to the, to the physical bookstore. You remember when those <laughs> were a big thing? I would go into the physical bookstore and there would be the Harlequin, you know, or that, uh, you know, the, the, um, what was that famous? Uh, Fabio. 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 There you go. The Fabio with his shirt dangling and the, 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 the busty lady on a pirate ship, you know? And I remember one of my aunts reading those all the time. And I was just like, even as a kid, I was like, oh, really? <laughs> like, you know, um, and, but what really had, had to take off was that people could then do it on Kindle. So romance, especially in steamier ones, um, in certain type of genres where people may not want the cover to be there, uh, those are, those have really developed more of an avid uh, readership. And KU is just a way to satiate that insatiable uh, need for more content. Um, these things really drive true in um, more so in certain genres than others. We don't, we're collecting data as we speak, but I, I can say without a doubt, romance is like insane well, for What are for some Dave. of the other genres that are doing phenomenally well? Um, well, let's see. Uh, fantasy so far has been looking pretty legit. Um, although I, I think audiobook is killing the whole KU thing a bit to it um i'm seeing i'm seeing audible take off more so with science fiction and fantasy than in a lot of others is um, it because they're longer like books usually like 40 hours or something <laughs> yeah the, the brandon sanderson's of the world are, are are you know truly driving that one um oh god i love i i also think too is a big part of what's really improving and shifting a lot of the market from ku to audible is that the narrators are just becoming that much better. I mean, holy moly. Um, a buddy of mine uh, from Sri Lanka, uh, Yuda, please don't ask me to pronounce his entire name, but I, every time I go back to Sri Lanka, him and I sit down, he finally just signed with Podium and just got notified that Nathan Fillion is narrating his book. That's if you're not a cool. Firefly fan, like <laughs> Nathan Fillion is my good, captain. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I got a quote from him up on the top of it that says, I aim to misbehave, you know, um, <laughs> I just love Firefly and Nathan Fillion is narrating his. Um, also too, uh, some of the self-published authors, um, uh, some of the buddies of mine have, what is his name? Gianco Carlo, you know, the guy who played, yeah. um, from Carlo from Breaking Bad. <laughs> yeah, from Breaking Bad. He's, re he's now reading them. Interesting enough is, is that while Corona has happened, a lot of these actors don't have places to go or don't have acting jobs because they've been shut down. So they've been turning to narrating books. I it's want Danny money. DeVito to do my erotica series, Flabio. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like that, Dave. It's, it's not my kind of genre, but I'd probably uh, listen to that because that's great. Yeah, but yeah, I actually just bought a book because I saw that Nathan Fillion is actually narrating. So what... I think it's happening and I know we went from KU now to audible, but I do think certain genres are sweeping more towards audible. Um, I think that there's going to be more, I think in the future audible is going to uh, continue to crush it um, and be a bigger part of the market. But to go back to your original question, I think KU is, is a much bigger thing for fiction than in nonfiction. Um, and yeah, you're going to see some certain genres that that won't work like literary fiction or memoir, certain memoirs, like, well, I imagine like, it also teaches you to write or not teaches you to write, but teaches you to do a better job of writing to market. So I imagine, or, or writing for KU because it is fundamentally a different bookstore than Barnes and Noble. So not only do you want to write genre instead of literary, you really want to focus on series, right? So yeah. we have, we have a lot of stuff that we're like, okay, well, this is why it's not performing in KU because stacked up against all the other stuff in KU, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I imagine that's part of it. And, and my other question there too, is how do you, um, do you know when to navigate? So if you're a fiction author, obviously KU is a very powerful place to be, 
even besides Amazon, it's what the second biggest bookstore in the world, <laughs> right? So um, that is a place where you, you want to get exposure. But is there, um, what do you pay attention to when you know, okay, this product line, even if I have new stuff that's still going to be in KU, this product line, I should start taking wide. Is there a, a strategy or a discipline or a set of questions that you ask to make that migration? Yeah, on, on my podcast, I once did a interview of somebody who was like super anti KU in, in uh, the fiction world and super pro KU. And I brought him on and we kind of uh, had an organized food fight. Um, and the overall ending was that what I found was the person in KU had utilized all of the components that KU offers, like the, you know, the countdown, the, the setting it for free, and utilize those opportunities to help market their book. The person who loved wide had actually marketed their books wide. They didn't just throw them on Barnes and Noble and iTunes. So they, they, they had a separate plan for how to market Apple than Barnes and Noble. And they actually treated them as individual communities instead of exactly. a blanket of readers. That's right. And on top of that too, they actually focused on getting reviews for those instead of just leaving them blank. It's funny as I almost say, uh, 10 Amazon reviews is, is the equivalence of one iTunes or Barnes and Noble review. That's so true. <laughs> so you know, true. it's like, and, and how easy would it be to get, and oh, by the way, and you know, but I, I know that scammers aren't, aren't listening to this, so we should be good, but um, they're not hardcore at all about, wait a Dude, second, the you guys are, are friends. They're all on the warrior forum right now. They're, they're not That's listening right. to this. Black hat world. Yeah, exactly. No. Um, but the there those markets are not as hardcore about figuring out that wait a second you're related to this person you know or your friends and i'm not saying that that you should now get your mom to put in your stuff um but what i am saying is is that there are a lot of legitimate people who have reviewed my books you reviewed your books and it was rejected off of some oh, yeah. crazy algorithm yeah that's we have, bogus we have that we it, what sucks is that these are the people who engage with us historically right. on social media and stuff so they think we have some relationship mm -hmm. when really it's just our best fans that right. happened to us a while back where they just like amazon purged hundreds of reviews from across mm -hmm. our catalog and it was our best reviews from our best fans that all just disappeared yeah whereas itunes of Arden and noble don't and so if i had somebody who who and, and this happens if people contact me and said, hey, like I left a review, but didn't go through, you know, then what I'll tell them is, well, oh, would you mind going to iTunes then? And boom, there it is. Uh, so awesome. that can be an outlet to be able to, for people who want to leave a review, a legitimate review, there's their outlet. And um, and again, it's, it's one of the things where I looked at books and <laughs> like, there's five reviews on this one book and the rest have no reviews. And, you know, it's like, wow. You know, you really don't have to work hard on that. So going back to it is, is that I really think it's important that if you do go wide, then treat it well, you know, don't just throw it out there and just hope something happens and then get mad at Barnes and Noble and iTunes when nothing occurs. Um, that's the same as throwing it on Amazon and doing nothing. And, you know, we all know how that can go if you don't do it. So give it a chance. So I think that's really my parting, parting shot on that is that um, if you do decide to try uh, experiment or test or go wide, then try it for real, like develop a bit of a plan, just put a little effort into it and you will see more dividends than just throwing it out there and hope it works well. So that's actually a really good segue into what would be my last formal question. And that is, um, do you think this would be predictive? So obviously you aren't gonna have empirical data for this, but I'm curious whether you think that um, Amazon will be able to close some of these scammer loopholes because right now we're in this kind of, it feels like an adolescence of, um, of, of ebook publishing and nobody kind of has, has it figured out yet really in the big picture. And so the example that we were just talking about about it reviews is a perfect example of how the net will get the good with the bad. And so saying that these two people are closely related, therefore this review must be coerced or, or, or bought in some way is really, really close to this is a fan of this person and that's why they're close. Like it's chicken and egg. So, but there's a lot of that stuff. There's um, ways to scam the, pay, the KU page reads and stuff. So what do you think, like, do you think that, that Amazon will get better at that? Yeah, that's a really uh, good question. I don't think they will <laughs> um, because there's not, there's not enough incentive. Love the it. honesty. Well, yeah, that was great. <laughs> comes, it comes back to what makes Amazon more money right? The whole purpose of why Amazon cares about reviews, and this is my speculation, is that um, 
imagine like they make the sale. That's great. But if people continue to buy stuff on Amazon and it turns out to be crap, I'm going to be less likely to ever buy on Amazon. I mean, this is kind of what's happened on, on eBay. eBay used to be hot. It used to be cool. And then all these rip off Chinese manufacturers got involved. And now I can't even trust that whatever I'm buying is going to be real. Oh, it's a North Face jacket. Uh, no, it's North Face, you know, um, like a what? prey station. Yeah, a prey station. That's right. I, I, I mean, and even more so is, is that they're not, um, they're just not uh, enforcing it. There's no ability to force it on eBay. And so a lot of people lost trust from eBay. And now it's, oh, when's the last time you bought something on eBay? Never. Uh, it's like Forget 10 serving. years ago. <laughs> right. I, I, I can't even remember the last time I bought an eBay. But 10 years ago, I used to buy a lot of things on eBay. That's what Amazon's trying to combat with reviews is so that companies don't make illegitimate things and then make, you know, um, hose the system with a whole bunch of fake reviews, get it in front of shoppers and then make shoppers mad. That's why they care. So if they end up taking away all, and by the way, they don't want humans to have to do this because that would be trillions of things they would have to go look into. So they create an automatic system that uses certain algorithms to figure out whether or not this tips the scale this way or that way. And we all theorize about what those potential triggers can be. Uh, that's why it's a bit maddening where sometimes this one thing triggers it, whereas it could be 50 things that triggered it ultimately. But here's the thing, if they end up, so if they end up creating this automatic system that does all that, and it will clean a lot of the bad stuff, but also kills off hundred of yours, you know, Johnny, and, and oh no, did that really hurt them? Does that actually cost them more money? No. So why even tweak the system? Why spend more money on improving it when they've done the thing that helps to save them money? So that's why I don't think we'll ever see anything better. Where do you think the line is? Because I would go back to my earlier argument and maybe this is me telling Amazon, well, this would be better for you. And they're like, ha ha ha, you silly person. You don't even understand. But it seems to me, like I said, as a, as a, as a shopper, it's maddening, right? Well, I think so. I think this might be the disconnect. Yours, uh, I shop in a different way. Well, no, no, no. I don't think that. I think Dave might have heard the question specifically in regards to reviews, and you're asking the question in regards to like scammers in, general. in general. So right. So, so, like, so somebody does oh, a thousand-page yeah, like uh, yeah, right. sci-fi book that's really just a link on the first page to go to the end, so that they get a thousand KNEP. That sort of scam. The scam that could potentially detract from readers, the customers finding maybe the ideal book for them. Yeah, um, in that case, no, that's, a, sorry. I was taking it from specifically the review point. Um, it, there's a big thing about uh, what books they show people, right? Amazon wants to make money. Um, and if you constantly show them books that, that do not fit search criteria, that aren't what people are looking for, um, that are either crap or have tricks up their sleeves, that's gonna hurt the bottom line big time. Um, and their A9 algorithm team, that's, that's actually the name of the search is called A9. Um, it used to be its own company, which interesting enough, it's no longer over some craziness that happened. Um, <laughs> I can go down a whole rabbit hole on that one, but there's a lot of legal issues. And then all of a sudden A9 became a part of Amazon, um, so that Amazon could have more control on what they put where, but, uh, they, that, that division before it got shut down had the largest job openings than any other component. It was insane how many people were they were adding to it. So I would say that that information there is, is my belief that they are looking to expand and improve the A9 algorithm more so than a lot of things on Amazon itself. So they're obviously looking for ways to improve showing the right thing to the right customer. Uh, when it comes to scams, like where people are doing that, that link thing that you're talking about for KU, yeah, that's, that's bad business. Um, that could also get them into hot water. Um, that, I mean, technically, if people are doing that in Amazon and it was proven that Amazon knew that they were doing it and they didn't correct it, um, authors could technically try to sue. Um, yeah, that's some class action stuff right there. Exactly. So that, again, it comes right back to that statement, what makes Amazon more money or what stops them from losing a lot of money. Um, so I see them really being on top of that. And they did. They went heavy handed. Uh, they went personal. They took out certain big names, made it very public. Um, they're, they're good at doing that. They did that when, uh, there were companies selling reviews back in the day, they actually yeah, took them to that. court and they made it very public. And that was their, as we say in the military shot across the bow. 
Um, and then all of a sudden, a lot of these companies just start dropping. So yeah, they'll take action, especially if it's, it's going to either hurt them, hurt their brand, cost them money. Um, you know, those things they'll do. But going back to the reviews, I think the system they have in place is as good as it will ever get. So, okay. Um, my last question before we um, start closing down is what has you most excited about this industry? Because you put your whole self into it. I mean, you're not just doing your own thing. You're doing things on behalf of the industry. So you obviously care and care deeply. So your answer is invested. And those are my favorite. <laughs> so what has you most excited about this, about where we are and where we're going? I am excited about Amazon ads. Um, and I, I like Amazon ads because for the first time, authors can at least say that they got people to see their book. Like it gives you power to at least do that. Um, one of the biggest struggles- So you don't see the, the pay for play as a bad thing at all. You see it as a really positive thing where now everybody, as long as you can get the ad going, everybody kind of has the same opportunity. Exactly. I have seen people create an amazing book cover. I've seen those same people write an amazing book description and an incredible story that when they got into the hands of people, that people loved it. The problem is they couldn't get it in front of people. They either had poor launches, they, they did things wrong, they didn't understand you know, a lot of the steps to, to actually marketing itself. And oh, by the way, they launched it and it fell flat. Being able to, taking a flat book that, that failed in its launch to a relevant book again is a lot harder than just relaunching a new book. So this gave authors the final ability to say, you know what, all right, I can at least take this one huge factor away, which is, uh, you know, if only people would see my book. Well, okay, now people can see your book. Um, and what is really drawn me to Amazon ads is that for the first time, you can now see uh, really important information about your book. Hey, did you know that 80,000 people looked at your book cover and only one person decided to click on it? Yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem. That, and, and by the way, fixing that problem will fix all the other problems. Um, now you know that, hey, people aren't interested or they're confused by your cover and title. Um, or It's great hey, if people you know? use data to actually improve their writing and their marketing because these are like, our authors are artists and a lot of times they just dig their heels in on my instincts say this and this is what I'm supposed to say with my story and if if readers aren't connecting with it, then readers aren't connecting with it. And there is reason, there are reasons for that always. I, I, I think it's sort of yeah. the same as like people that aren't informed are more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. So writers that aren't informed about these things are more likely to think that, you know, Amazon's out to get them or whatever. They're going to make up their own facts basically to not do anything. And, and sometimes, you know, it really comes uh, out as either desperation or also, you know, uh, it's not my writing, you know, it's, it's not my writing and, and all these other people are really destroying the system, you know. Um, but like I said, the more you get into it, the more you're starting to find there's ways to understand what's going on in, in the system. Um, you know, like we we're saying, now you see that 80,000 people have seen your book and 100 people clicked on it, but no one bought it. That means that 100 people, you finally got to come to your book sales page and nobody cared to click the purchase. Um, so is that your book description? You know, uh, is it your editorial review or the lack thereof? Is it something, you know, is it that the top review is one star um, and it's scathing? Like you at least now know that there's a problem and you can fix it. And when you have that system down, when you have covers that, that draw interest and, uh, you know, book descriptions that convert, you can finally see the numbers and all of your tactics to bring people to your book will now have better fruition than what was happening before, which is you doing all this work, bringing people to your book and nobody caring because your book description, you know, read like a book report or gave away the answer or just sounded as, as, you know, as entertaining as watching paint dry. Well, this has been an amazing episode, um, Dave. I was uh, my head really hurts <laughs> um, in a good way though. I, I my think my wife says that all the time too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, I don't Me have too. sort of a data analysis brain, but I'm glad that there are data analysis brains out there. So you on your side and then people like Neve on our side who hopefully will take some of this and parse it. Um, I could keep delving. This was really, really cool. So thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Um, so your site is Kindlepreneur and also publisher rocket. Uh, anything else you want people to know about? No, that's about it. Um, if anybody has any questions or so, you can always go to the contact page and hit me up and I'll be more than happy to respond. 
Excellent. Awesome. Well, thank uh, you. Thank you so much. Yep. Again, so much. Yeah, it was great. And thanks for everybody else listening. Uh, thanks, thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time on SB. Adios.